What made Adam and Eve righteous when they were in the garden? Was it their performance? No. 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 And we often think that. Well, they were perfect. They were doing everything right. Okay, so they were righteous because they were doing the right things. And so what makes a person righteous is how he performs. Yeah, but see, we don't do right things, so now we need God's grace. But see, that's the problem here. Adam and Eve were righteous or justified before God, not because of what they were doing. They were righteous before God the same way that you are. Why are you righteous before God? Because of Christ. Because of God's grace. Because you're depending on his grace, and you're totally receiving his grace. You're passing before him. That's the same exact way that Adam and Eve were righteous before God. They were dependent on God's grace. Living before God as passive individuals, receiving from God what God gave, and recognizing that he is the author of all these things, they lived by grace. And the reason I want you to recognize that is I want you to see that God does not change his plan or change his way of dealing with us. People have sometimes this idea that in the Old Testament, people were saved because of what they did or didn't do. And if they were obedient to the sacrificial system and they followed the system, then they were saved. And if they kept the covenant, then they would be saved. Is that true? No. It's not true. And people have the idea that, oh, Adam and Eve were righteous before God because they were doing the right stuff. They were, they were performing the way they were supposed to. And so that's what made them righteous. They were perfect. They were doing the right stuff. They were, so they're righteous. Their performance has nothing to do with it. What's that? Except that we don't know what they were doing. Well, we do have a pretty good idea. They were having dominion over the garden. They were taking care of it. <coughs> they were being fruitful, working on multiplying. And so they were doing what God had put them there to do, worshiping God honoring him. Now, how long that went on, we don't know, whether it was a couple hours or a couple days or weeks or millennia, who knows. But they were living for this time before God the way God wanted them to be living and serving him. Things were right. And the reason they're righteous is because they're living dependent on God for God's grace. In the Old Testament, what made Moses righteous? His faith. He's depending on God, trusting in God for everything. What made Abraham righteous? By faith. What makes David righteous? His relationship with God. Grace. Not about faith. Not about works. Not about his actions. Not about his performance. What makes you righteous? God's grace. Faith. Your performance has nothing to do with it. So, works never have anything to do with salvation. Ever, or with righteousness before God. Never have anything to do with this. They didn't have anything to do with it in the garden. They didn't have anything to do with it in the Old Testament. They don't have anything to do with it in the New Testament. And I want you to get this down because we have so many people running around who think that ultimately the reason I'm righteous before God is I'm doing the right stuff now because I've got Christ and the Holy Spirit. And so now I'm righteous because I'm doing right stuff. No. Never has anything to do with it. Works, our actions, our performance never has anything to do with your standing before God. Your standing before God is always dependent purely upon grace. It's dependent upon God doing absolutely everything. Period. <clears throat> now, back to the crux tale of Gorham one more time. So we're saved by grace. 100% God's work. We are sustained by grace. 100% God's work. And we ultimately are taken to eternal life to participate in the eschatological reality we fulfilled it all in the ball things by grace God does it all everything it's all grace and your works never have anything to do with it ever it's all God and at the same time remember I stress the other side is 100% your responsibility you're still responsible for doing the right stuff making the right decisions choosing the right things God holds you accountable. And so if you make the wrong decision, you're accountable. If you do bad actions, you're accountable. And if you do right things, God gets the credit. That's the way it works, all the way through. So it has always been this way. Man, humanity, has always lived before God only by grace, never by works. Always. God's consistent. He doesn't change the rules. And there are lots and lots of Christians running around who think that on the Old Testament they were saved because of their good works. Adam and Eve were righteous because they were perfect. 
And now we are saved because we have Christ, and now he enables us to live the way God wants us to live. And they start muddling things drastically because they begin to believe that their right standing before God is because they're doing right stuff. By God's grace, but it's their performance. That's always a problem. Okay? With me on that? So, let's talk then about sin and about evil. And that's what our chapter now is getting into. What is evil? What is sin? Sin actually has several definitions we can live with. What are some of the definitions for sin? Miss the mark. All right. One of the classic ones is the hamartia, the miss the mark. Okay? And you have there the idea of the guy who's taking target practice and shooting at the bullseye. He misses. In fact, misses the target altogether. You're wide of the mark. Miss the mark. That's clearly one of the definitions of sin. What else? Original sin. Okay, we've got original sin lurking around over here, and we need to talk about that. In fact, that's going to be our first big topic here in a moment. Original sin, a little different than that. Okay, other definitions for the sin that we might carry out? Deny God. Okay, so a denial of God, or you might say of God's will. In fact, corollary of this is, sin is any violation of God's will. Sin is any violation of God's will. Any other thoughts on this? Evil, then, is not simply the absence of good. Evil is not simply the um, non-existence of what is right. Evil has a tangible, active presence. It's a thing. It's not just the, uh, an absence of something. And that, you know, that kind of gets back to what I was saying about um, Christian scientists and even Augustine a little bit here, where that evil is the non-presence of good. And that doesn't do it justice. It is a tangible, active, willful kind of a thing. It has an existence of its own, actively denying God's will, missing the mark, failing to do what God has planned for that person to do. So, any failure to live up to God's will, that would be sin. What do you think of that definition of sin? Any failure to live up to God's will is sin. What does it do to our understanding of sin? What qualifies as sin? Everything we do. Yeah, just about everything. You see, that, that's, we, we um, kind of blow right by this and don't pay much attention to it, but this is a pretty, pretty tough definition. Any violation of God's will qualifies as sin. So if you intentionally do something against one of the Ten Commandments and violate it, well, that's against God's will. That's sin. We're okay with that. You know, so you take someone's life, sin. All right. But what if you don't intervene when you could have? Is it God's will for you to do something about a problem and intervene? Sure. Didn't do it. Sin? Yeah. Sin. Not just well, lapse or, you know, poor judgment. God calls it sin. So when you have opportunity to do good and choose not to, sin. When you could have been doing something better with your time than you were doing, God's will would have been for you to be using your time more wisely. Is that sin? That's sin. And you begin to realize that if you operate seriously with the definition that sin is any violation of God's will, the sin starts to mount up and sin becomes a much bigger problem for us which is exactly what we want to have happen here. That's the goal. Sin needs to become really sinful and needs to well into importance when we realize how really significant it is. It is. All right. Now, when we talk about sin, we do distinguish two kinds of sin. And we make the distinction between what we call actual sin and original sin. And actual sin would be the sins that you, by choice, are committing. The things you're doing that are against the will of God, actual sins, actually carrying out things that shouldn't be done or failing to do things, anything that you are doing actively in your life, that's actual sin. And actual sin would include then both sins of omission as well as sins of commission. Both of those fall into there. And I'm not sure how many M's go into omission, but that's the way I've got it now. All right? 
sins of omission and commission. They both fall in there. They're part of the actual sins. But before we get to there and spend more time on that, let's talk about original sin a little bit. What is original sin? What do we mean by it? Our sinful nature. Okay, our sinful nature. All right. Tell me more about original sin. The corruption of creation. The corruption of creation. The brokenness of creation. All right. Tell me more. The fall of man. The fall. So it has something to do with the fall of man, the fall of Adam. All right. More. You mentioned uh, um, Augustine. The yeah. word he uses a lot, and that Martin Luther used too, was uh, concupiscence. Concupiscence. Mm-hmm. I, at first I was confused about that word, but I think it's a pretty good word. Okay. Can be. Now that you brought it up, I'll talk about it. <laughs> All right. 